Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. The recording machine is on. Oh, good. Good. There, there's, you're not making me eat anything, are you? No. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me, as usual, is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Hello, everybody, and I hope you're having a wonderful evening. Or morning. Or whatever time. Whatever time of day that this happens to be. It's that you are listening. Yeah. It's evening here. It's evening here. That's why I went straight to... Yeah. Evening. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and a Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. checked if we have any more crime con tickets oh. sold any more uses of our poutine 2020 for 10 percent off your crime con ticket so maybe in the, in the last week we we can we're getting a free uh lear jet no i don't think that's gonna happen oh, but please 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 oh. if you're going use poutine 2020 for 10 percent off because it actually really does help the show this helps everybody you get to save money yeah we get to save uh, money, save money yeah. you know, uh, and so it just everybody comes out a winner. There you go. Yeah. And the Umber Yard's doing well. We it, just it broke is. 40 or 7,500 people in there. So it's almost as big as my hometown. <laughs> so it's <laughs> like this perspective right there. It's Jeez. like I'm the mayor of Bridgewater. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's something to aspire to anyway. Yeah, well, hey, you got to have goals. So this show is going to be a long overdue palate cleanser. Uh, please. This week we're taking a break from the murders, missing persons, and mayhem to chat about a mystery that I've been looking forward to covering for a while. Yeah, and I I, I think a lot of people outside of BC, at least outside of Canada, have no idea. We don't cover the unexplained and paranormal as much as I'd like. In a few episodes we've spoken about Canadian ghost stories, yep. we talked about UFOs, and we've mentioned Sasquatch from time to time. Yep. I want to do more. Yep. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. A few times on the show, we've mentioned this enigmatic creature that we're about to discuss just in passing. Mm -hmm. I even appeared on episode 32 of the 36 Times podcast with our friends Lily and Krista when they chatted about this. Oh. Right. But it's high time that we dedicate an entire episode to it. We're going to dig in. Dig in. We're going to dig in. Yeah. I got my shovel. (laughs) Because there's a lot of things to shovel. (laughs) Well, aside from this, yeah. This is episode 113, The Okanagan Oddity, Ogopogo, BC's answer to the Loch Ness Monster. Mm Mm-hmm. It's in BC. It's as well known as the Loch Ness Monster. Everybody will know what you're talking about if you mention Ogopogo. Yeah. Outside of here, though. No. I don't think so. So what does Ogopogo look like? Well, from TourismColona.com, quote, descriptions vary, but certain characteristics have been repeated through the decades. Ogopogo is green with a snake-like body about 25 meters long. So that's pretty darn long. Yeah. Some say its head looks like a horse, while others say it's reptilian or goat-like. I've even heard sheep-like. 
Wow. Yeah. Weird. You don't typically get uh, a horse or sheep or... Yeah. When you're talking about sea creatures. It's very odd. A lake creature, not a sea creature. A water sea. creature. Yeah, a water exactly. water creature. While scientists and skeptics claim there is no proof of Ogopogo's existence, over the years many have sworn that they've seen it. Some will show you video and photographs that they claim they have captured of this elusive creature. Sure. We will cover a number of purported sightings during this episode. I look forward to it. Me too. I am uh, the skeptic, but I look forward to it. I'm not a skeptic at all, Scott. I fully believe that Ogopogo <laughs> exists. That should be your next tattoo. That's that's the position I'm going to take. I, it should be Ogopogo. It really should. should. That or in Sasquatch. You should really get them on you. Having a kiss. Now kiss. <laughs> Tyson. <laughs> We'll be referring to the cryptid mostly as Ogopogo, the most popular name for the creature throughout the podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, the history of it, though, is much older than that moniker, and its story has morphed over the years. So this will be new to me. Like, Good. Like a lot of things there. <laughs> in this world. As well in this episode, you may hear some excerpts referring to the indigenous people of the region as Indians, yeah. males as Braves, Mm -hmm. and females as squaws. We do understand this is not the correct term to refer to people. Yep. However, to preserve the integrity of other authors' writing, we'll use the terms only within the quoted source material. Yes. So the, when you is hear this, those, that is not our words. This is not language we would feel comfortable using outside of quoting. Correct. I would not. Yeah. So the legend of Nahatik. Of the spirit of the lake. Well done. Oh, well. I think. I don't know. <laughs> it dates back far before Europeans set foot in Canada. Hmm. Thousands of years ago, a group of inland Salish indigenous people called the Okanagan, now also referred to as the Sealks, settled a large area that covers area in British Columbia and Washington State in what's now called the Okanagan Valley or Okanagan mm -hmm. Country. With these people came their legends. Mm -mm. According to an article about the Sealks on Wikipedia, at the height of the Okanagan culture about 3,000 years ago, it's estimated that 12,000 people lived in this valley and the surrounding areas. Jeez. That's a lot 3, of... 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago, 12,000 12, people. That's quite a community. Yeah. Uh, For it's, a, it's a very remote area. but And it's very broad as well, but at the same time, to have that number of human beings... Yeah. Living in that area, there's got to be an economy, there's got to be Absolutely. trails and roads yeah. and uh, settlements, yeah, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, With the recent developments in Canada and ongoing reconciliation efforts with the Indigenous peoples of North America, we'd be remiss if we didn't speak about the earliest inhabitants of the region that we're talking about <laughs> today. From Seelks.org, quote, For thousands of years, we the Seelks... Okanagan people were self-reliant and well provided for throughout our own ingenuity and use of the land and resources. We lived united as a nation with a whole economy, traveling the breadth and depth of our territory, hunting, fishing, growing, harvesting, and trading created a sustainable economy that met our needs." End quote. Mm. As European settlers began to arrive, colonizing the land, the Sea Elks were, quote, dispossessed from the resources they relied upon and their self-sufficient economy collapsed. International and provincial boundaries were set by the European colonizers without any input nor a treaty from the Okanagan people. The Sea Elks were forced onto reserves in the early 1900s. In 1981, the Okanagan Nation, ONA, was formed as the inaugural First Nations government in the Okanagan, which represents eight member communities. Mm. The last sentence on the Sealks.org about page reads, quote, We as the Sealks, Okanagan people, still affirm the land is ours as no treaty has been negotiated. So there you go. According to Bill Estesiuk's site, ogopogoquest.com, there are a few things that differentiate Lake Okanagan from other lakes. Oh, is it gr blue, red? Well, purple? Quote, 
Located at 49 degrees 50 minutes north latitude, 119 degrees 32 minutes west longitude, Lake Okanagan is situated in the interior of southern British Columbia, Canada, about 400 kilometers from the world-renowned city of Vancouver. Mm-hmm. It is approximately 120 kilometers long. That's quite a lake. Jeez. 3.5 kilometers wide and is 235 meters deep at its deepest point. Yeah, that is deep. That is deep. That's deep. Lake Okanagan had a fairly unique geological development. Some of the factors influencing its origin include tertiary, volcanic, and sedimentary activity, fault rupturing, regional tectonic forces, stream dissection, and deep erosion. So, which is a great band, by the way. Deep erosion. Yeah, yeah. These glaciers and interglacial streams were the main causes behind the deepening formation of the original valley. Because of this activity, Okanagan Lake has been referred to as a fjord lake, mm. which may have been open to the sea at one time. Many of these streams Jeez. may have been interconnected. Mm. End quote. I love the word fjord. Fjord. Fjord? It's a fjord. The first European settler to make note of the legend of Nahatik was Canadian author and pioneer Susan Louisa Moir Allison. Susan Allison was born on August 18th, 1845 a while ago. in Sri Lanka, which was then called Ceylon. Good old Sri Lanka. Her parents owned a tea plantation there. After her father died, Susan's mother remarried and the family moved to Hope, B.C. in 1860. Jeez. Susan married John Fall Allison, who was one of the founders of Princeton, B.C. in 1868. Okay. And the couple soon moved to the Similkameen Valley and were, apparently, the first non-Indigenous settlers in the area other than priests who were there on missions. Okay. The Allisons raised 14 children there. Holy crap. It just blows my mind, though. Like, you're living in Sri Lanka. How does it even come about, you know, let's go move to Hope? Hope, in, B.C. In, in, in the mid-1800s. Like, yeah. How would you even know of Hope, B.C.? There's uh, no Google. <laughs> No. How would you even, like, you just, hmm, you know where we should go? Hope. <laughs> Hope. Wow. According to an abridged edition of the book A Pioneer Gentlewoman in British Columbia, The Recollections of Susan Allison by Margaret A. Ormsby, mm -hmm. early on in their stay in the area, Susan and her husband listened to the indigenous storytellers in the region, quote, tell tales about the big men of the mountains, the Sasquatch, oh. and the monster of the Okanagan Lake, Okopogo. She felt exhilarated at the thought of the wild, free life she would now live. Wow. End quote. Wow. Pretty pretty cool, right? Yeah. Hey, poor o o Ogie, though, getting called a monster. I always pictured it as a cartoon kid. There are some pretty monstrous oh. stories that people have as we go. Oh, goodness gracious. So Arlene Gall claims in her book... In Search of Ogopogo, Sacred Creature of the Okanagan Waters, at one point, around 1872, Susan Allison herself had seen the Ha'atik swimming in the waters of Lake Okanagan. Well, she got to see it herself. I have been unable to find the exact references to Susan Allison's yeah. sighting in the writings that uh, are, are attributed to her. The ones that I was able to acquire, anyway. They may exist, but I don't have them. Oh, it's too bad she didn't have a cell phone. Right? Exactly. She did write briefly about hearing tales of the creature from indigenous men acting as guides for she and her husband as they toured the Similkameen Valley. Mm. A man Mrs. Allison called Yakum Tikum, and I don't know if that's a real name or not. Okay. This person was apparently acting as their cook on their expedition, and he's the one who was telling stories of Nahatik. The man spoke, quote, as if it were some supernatural entity mm. and pointed out where it lived on an island in Okanagan Lake as we passed the spot, oh. end quote. Now, if I'm putting myself in their shoes at that time, man, that would be exciting. Yeah. The thought of, like, scary, but also exciting. Yeah. Oh. You've heard of, like, weird things like cannibals and all kinds yeah, of... Yeah, and, and everything that at that point in history, new things are being found daily. Yeah. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility that no. this thing is... Re and so you hearing that, you would just be like, oh, my God. Exactly. It's King Kong over there. So the island that Yakum Tikum was appointing at was called Rattlesnake Island. 
And legend has it that Nahatik lives in the water near there. Mm -hmm. From Arlene Gall's book, In Search of Ogopogo, in 1977, Elder Chief Bill Derrickson wrote, quote, This lake is like a living, sacred thing. In an hour or two, this lake can be a raging body of water and very dangerous. In this lake, we have Nahatik, the serpent that lives in the water and has been told to me by my great-great-grandfather and told to him by his ancestors. No Indian would attempt to cross Okanagan Lake without first offering prayer to the Great Spirit or without carrying a small animal sacrifice should they come into contact with the serpent. This offering can be viewed as spiritual as a spiritual act of sacrifice or as a way of appeasing a hungry monster, end well, quote. Yeah, I mean, it's that whole, um, if you're going hiking, go with somebody slower than you. Yeah. So in case a bear comes, it'll get the slower piece. So yeah, you got to have like, oh, here comes, let me throw this chicken chicken in the water. <laughs> yeah, chickens were the most common thing that they would For sure, yeah. for sure. Easy to grab and you just, okay, paddle, paddle. He's going for the chicken, paddle. George Derrickson's uh, quote there uh, follows with what Susan Allison earlier wrote. She wrote, quote, Johnny had some tobacco he had grown himself from seed the priests had given him mm -hmm. and had grown and cured and fixed it up himself. The talk turned on the monster Ogopogo. Johnny wanted to bring a team across the lake to assist Hang, so he drove them to the narrows where he often crossed the horses he used hunting, but he always had taken a chicken or a little pig and dropped it into the lake when they neared the middle. This time he forgot the chicken and was towing horses by a long rope. Suddenly, something, he could not see what, dragged the horses down underwater, and the canoe he was in would have gone too had he not severed the rope with his sheath knife and hurried across. Dang. He never saw any vestige of his horse team again. These stories had a strange charm for me, she says. I could have sat up all night and listened to them, but the air was getting cold, so I turned in and slept the sleep of the just. End quote. Now, is it possible that the horse is just drowned? But yeah, well, could be. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Why would Johnny lie? No, I don't think, well, I'm not saying he is. You're right. I'm saying that he may have thought, but he may have been wrong. As the Europeans continued settling the area, many heard the tale of the spirit of the lake passed on to them by the Sea Elks people. According to an article in the Winnipeg Tribune, the settlers were, quote, told strange tales of the devil that inhabited the lake. Damn. They made sacrifices to it from the cliffs of Squally Point before setting out on a lake voyage. Venison and juicy bear meat, crushed berry cakes and dried fish were thrown into the deep water with prayers for protection. So, yeah, like the picture they paint of our little fella in the water is serpent, monster. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Our 75 foot long little fella. Well, it's all a matter of perspective to a mountain. That's tiny. Yeah. There were dozens of sightings by European settlers in the area and drawing attention from scientists, looky loos, and monster hunters alike. Yeah, for sure. According to a local storyteller, Dave Parker, in 1923, divers looking for the remains of Nahatik scoured the bottom of the lake for evidence of the creature. They did find a skeleton, but it turned out to be that of a cow that had somehow made its way to the silty floor of Lake Okanagan. Cows shouldn't try to swim. Yeah. yeah. It just doesn't end well. They should put their little water wings on before they, they go. No, that, that, yeah, um, I always say that to people. Yeah. If you're going to take a cow for a swim, make sure you've got as Absolutely. Much that, that is the most important thing, I, I think. How many times I have to tell people that? The headline from a news article on page one of the Leader Post in Regina, Saskatchewan, on Tuesday, the 1st of September, 1925, screamed mm. to do battle with the lake creature. And the subheading read, terrifying monsters in depths of Okanagan Lake in BC to be investigated. Wow. Well, in 1925, how would you investigate? You just, like, you went and looked. Pretty much. <laughs> like, that's your science. You just took your magnifying yes. glass. Well, I've checked the water. I've checked a small portion at the top of the water. Yeah. I see nothing. I threw a chicken in. So the article goes on. Victoria, August 31st. 
long-necked, rough-skinned creatures who waddled across the surface of the earth long before men, monkeys, and evolution were heard of are living in depths of Okanagan Lake in the southern interior of British Columbia. It was reported to John P. Babcock, Deputy Commissioner of Fisheries today by R. Leckie Ewing, an angler from the district, Mr. Lecky Ewing is preparing to go forth and do battle with the monsters who live unknown in the lake bottom. Armed with a rifle, he plans to shoot one of the creatures and take it ashore. Mr. Babcock's theory that a big sturgeon, not serpents, are causing the discussion in the Okanagan district are treated with silent contempt by the men who have claimed to have seen the terrifying visitors. And the clarion war... On Ogopogo, right? Exactly. Wow! What? Wow! Brought a rifle. So we have heard tales of giant sturgeon in oh, yeah. Fraser River. Yeah. We've seen video. Yeah, we've seen yeah. all kinds of stuff. There are a few fishing companies dedicated to help angling tourists who come to the area mm -hmm. in catching the elusive fish. Yeah. Oh, Here's huge. some audio from a global news report in 2016 of one man's massive catch oh. of a sturgeon presumed to be as much as 85 years old. Jesus, that's older than you. Go shit your hat. <laughs> we all have that one friend who likes to embellish stories who swears it really happened. Well, one BC man has quite the tale to tell. He caught a giant, decades-old, massive sturgeon, and that's no lie. Reed Feist has a story that's now the talk of the town. Somebody look at this beast! It is the catch of a lifetime. A sturgeon thought to be an urban legend. Left him hard! Ten footer! Just over three meters, weighing 295 kilograms or about 650 pounds. Its name, Pig Nose, for its unique snout. You could say Nick McCabe is like a pig in you know what after catching the fish. Sure enough, hooked into one and it came flying out of the river and I've never seen guys run around in circles. It was awesome. The 19-year-old works for a BC fish touring company on the Fraser River. On Tuesday, he was out with a tour group when he hooked on to something. Everyone was excited. Yeah, we were just coming near the end of the day and Nick brought us to one more hole and we hooked into this big famous fish named Pig Nose and Nick was sure it was him and all the boys got pretty excited. So monstrous, it was no small effort reeling it in. Probably close to two hours by the time we got it up, about four kilometers downriver from where we started. Yeah, there we go. Pig Nose is thought to be 80 years old, and at some point, about four decades back, an injury helped inspire that nickname. He's been caught before several times in the last eight years, and by the other guide in town, so he kind of threw the name on it. This river is home to the supersized species of fish. Now, McCabe is the talk of the waters. There's little doubt this is the legendary fish. They took some photos, measured it, and tagged it, released it back into the river. The young fisherman already with some good catches this season, but nothing quite as fishy as this. Reed Feist, Global News. So, hey. Oh, yeah, Maybe this eh? guy in 1925 was on to something. Maybe the yeah. Ogopogo is just some big sturgeon Well, I, th I think, floating around in, in, in Okanagan Lake. I think what people think they see is typically going to be something like a, like a big fishy in the water. Well, we'll talk more about that as we go. Big fishy. It wasn't until 1926 that the legendary monster of Okanagan Lake actually got its anglicized name Ogopogo. Mm. Again, from Margaret Ormsby's book on the writings of Susan Allison, quote, at a luncheon in Vernon, a luncheon, <laughs> on August 23rd, 1926, when the members of the Vancouver Board of Trade were guests of the Vernon Board of Trade, oh. the Vernon Rotary Club, the Kalmulka Players, a group of talented amateurs at Vernon, provided entertainment. So quite the group. And the highlight was the singing of a parody song written by Davy Burnaby, H.F. Beatty's parody sung by W.H. Brimblecombe, oh contained God. the words, I'm looking for the Ogopogo, the bunny-hugging Ogopogo. His mother was an earwig, his father was a whale. I'm going to put a little bit of salt on his tail. Wow, it's quite the jam. It is quite the jam. Wow. Uh, do you want to hear a bit of the tune? I'm still stuck on Brimblecombe. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a name, Brimble, a Brimblecombe. Name. I do want to hear it. You do? I do. Okay, I, good. I think I need to. So here's a brief excerpt of the song as sung by Harry Fay 
from a 78 RPM record that was recorded in September of 1924. Wow. Do I have to pull out my uh, <laughs> crank uh, no. ventrophone or whatever the hell they call no, it? No, I, I actually oh, took you have it a, from YouTube. You have it digitally. Yeah, oh. there we go. I'm looking for the old 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 Ending. Yeah, it's weird, eh? It kind of sounds like you doing a, your old time voice. A little bit of oh, go, yeah. oh, go. Oh, my mm. goodness. I could, like, it's a pretty fat jam. I could picture, you know, some uh, Dre producing. It it goes on to repeat Timber, the same thing over and over again. It Timber actually gets Land. on your nerves pretty Timber. badly. Yeah, but it's because it needs a fella. <laughs> We just need Timberland yeah. in there. and uh, so There's yeah. a much cleaner copyrighted version on YouTube yeah. by Paul Whiteman and his orchestra, uh, but we'll post a link to it in our show notes. Yeah. After Ogopogo had a more pronounceable and cute name, <laughs> uh, the masses picked up on it, and the sightings began in earnest, and newspaper coverage ramped up. Uh, I'd say. Uh, we'll get into a few of the historical sightings and speculate mm. what we think just might be lurking in Okanagan Lake, if anything at all. It's a swimming sales. After the break. And we're back. Uh, thoughts so far, Scott Hemingway. I'm loving the history. Mm -hmm. This is all new to me. All of this, uh, you know, I just knew a creature that would like to go dipping in the water. Yeah. And, and look at all of this education I'm getting. There you go. Yeah. In early 1927, the Vancouver Courier reported that Ogopogo had met its demise. No. After being trapped in the ice in Lake Okanagan. Oh. The Vancouver Province newspaper shot back that this was impossible, debunking the Courier's article. Quote, <laughs> For the information of readers in Vancouver and other points outside the Okanagan, it may be stated that Okanagan Lake, owing to its size and depth, does not freeze over as often as the ponds in Stanley Park. During only two of the last 30 winters has there been any impediment to navigation, and most years the lake is absolutely free of ice throughout the whole season. If the story has been built up out of baseless rumors, it does that paper no credit if they have introduced into it an unwarranted libel on the Okanagan climate, and in any event, a retraction and apology is due. End quote. That's journalism, Mike. Let's bring back journalism. Yeah, right? Right there. So you darn it all. Forth with. Vancouver Courier, you don't know that the mm. ice doesn't free. He can't have frozen in the ice. Because the ice didn't appear. It didn't appear. It, there was no ice, Mike. Case closed. <laughs> An article in the July 25th, 1928 edition of the Winnipeg Tribune titled The Ogopogo, spoke of the Ogopogo as part of the natural resources oh. of British Columbia. Oh. <laughs> it goes on to say that the water serpent is definitely a real thing. Oh. The writer goes on to prove his hypothesis, stating that it has been spotted again. The people reporting the sighting were not the typical disreputable lot, huh. like a drunken prospector who'd just stumbled out of a beer parlor. No, this time it was an irrefutable source. Oh. A troop of five girl guides and their adult troop leader. The article states, Girl guides, even in British Columbia, haven't got the habit of, quote, seeing things, end so, quote. So, you know, my two daughters have been in the girl guides. Mm-hmm. One still is in the girl guides. Yeah. It's, I'm sure they can see lots of crap. Science, though. So, I know. Yeah, you had, you had me a science. It's ir ir irrefutable. What I thought was the more things change, the more they stay the same. I guess the Girl Guides in 1928 were the scientific equivalent to Karen from Facebook. <laughs> Perhaps Gwyneth Paltrow should have Ogo Pogo on season two of Goop Lab. Oh, God, I can't watch that. I can't. You don't want a they, Gwyneth you Paltrow can... vagina no. candle? No, I don't. You can throw Ogo Pogo in there. I'll, I'll, I'll consider it now. Hopefully, if, if it's real, if Ogopogo was real, like just like 
bores through the goop lab and eats everybody there. <laughs> well, I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow only does real things, Mike. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on from that. In 1931, the Montreal Gazette reported that indigenous people in Williams Lake were afraid to cross the winter ice there. Mm. Ogopogo had somehow made its way through BC's, quote, interconnected, it's not actually, mm. lake system, going more than 400 kilometers northwest, smashing a large hole in the ice as a, quote, prank. Well, if there's anything I know uh, about Ogopogo, oh man, shit loves to prank. Well... Felice Ballot, a French-Canadian outdoorsman from Quebec, oh. was there in Williams Lake, quote, ready to do battle <laughs> with the Freak of the Deep. <laughs> Which was my first rap album's name. The Freak of the Deep? Yeah. He claimed that he had faced off with Ogopogo in Okanagan Lake two years prior and had, quote, hooked and broken Ogopogo's jaw. Whoa! Yeah. The oh. article said that Bilal, quote, believes that if he is unable to land his catch, yeah. he will at least, with his rope tackle, be able to choke it to death. Wow. This guy is very confident in his abilities. There was no follow-up to this article, nor any more mention of Bellow that I could find, so we can most likely presume he was ripped in half and devoured by uh, Pogo. I'm hoping so. He sounds like uh, Canada's answer to Davy Crockett. <laughs> Canada Crockett. Yeah. Coming to get you, Ogie. He's Doug, Doug Crockett. Eh? <laughs> I'm just picturing like, I'm going to get that goddamn thing hopping in his uh, Model T and driving. <laughs> his jalopy. <laughs> How did he break its jaw in the first? Like, I'm I'm picturing like uh, like a very close. Uh, he probably did a like a Tiger Williams style punch to its well, jaw. Well, I'm thinking I'm I'm like yeah. a hockey jersey. To... Yeah, I'm, that's what I'm picturing. <laughs> I'm picturing like this just this walloping right hook mm -hmm. to, uh, and then Ogopogo's like, whoa, dude, chill, man, whoa, man. chill. Whoa, I was just coming to say hi. I'm just doing weird like serpenty things in it was the just, it was lake. Just, it was just a prank. Yeah. In uh, 1933, Winnipeg Tribune article titled The Mysterious Ogopogo, the writer C.A. Hayden interviewed W.S. Harris, who was the editor and publisher of the Vernon News in Vernon, British Columbia. Man, Winnipeg's writing a lot about this thing. Yeah, right? Jesus. Listener beware, there are uses of racist and culturally ignorant terms used in the following quote. We didn't write it. We did not. Quote, Mr. Harris told how the Indians around the lake believed implicitly that there was a monster in its steps. They called it the Auk, A-U-C-K, and talk fearsomely of the legends handed down from the far-off past relating to the terror of the deeps. Strange to say, none of these legends tells of, of human beings becoming its prey, although there is one describing how a big buck deer was pulled underwater near Rock Point in a veritable geyser of a struggle when squaws in the canoes were killing off a herd which the braves and their dogs had driven into the lake. There was also the tale of a huge bone, supposed to be a relic of the auk, which was on display in Cameron's store in Vernon for years. Interesting. Right? So I'm curious about what that bone actually was, if it even existed. I couldn't find any other references to it, as oh, is man. typical with this kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if anybody knows what that bone was, please make a comment in the Yumber Yard, which is our Facebook group. So can't Cameron store is not around anymore? Something tells me it's not. <laughs> I didn't really look into it. <laughs> Throughout the rest of the 30s, there were a few more stories of Ogopogo in the papers, but attention of Canadians was turned elsewhere as World War II started to rage. Yeah, I mean, that'll take your focus. Right? Yeah, <laughs> Definitely it would. War. In 1949, another story of an Ogopogo sighting emerged in the August 22nd edition of the Windsor Star newspaper. So these are very national we, papers. We've got, we've got Montreal, mm -hmm. we've got Winnipeg, yeah. Saskatchewan, yep. and now we've got Windsor in the house. The title was, Responsible Witnesses Affirm Ogopogo of Okanagan Exists. Mm -hmm. The subheading read, Great snakes alive, they exclaim. <laughs> At first, they refuse to believe their eyes. Many stay silent, lest they be thought loony. You don't want to be thought of as loony. No. And before you ask, it wasn't more Girl Guides. Any guesses as to uh, the... Uh, um, uh, it was a lawyer. A lawyer. Oh. Yeah, it was a oh, lawyer. Okay. Yeah, you were right, because you can see the script. I didn't look. Okay. And I can't read. Yeah, but anyway... Uh, Wow. Lawyers, known for their honesty. Well. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so here's the story. Quote, a great many people in the Okanagan who have seen the Ogopogo regard it in much the same light. Take Honorable R.W. Craig, for example. He is a former attorney general mm. of the Manitoba in the Bracken government. Mm -hmm. A man of calm, sober, and judicial temperament, sure. who now, in retirement, owns an orchard at Naramata, which is along Lake Okanagan. The Okanagan is famous for orchards. Yeah. Seriously. One bright sunny afternoon some months ago, he was working in his rose garden. Sounds nice. Yeah. In the house were Mrs. Craig, his daughter, and a housekeeper. Mrs. Craig, from a window, saw Ogopogo. Oh, goodness. She called the daughter and the housekeeper, and they watched it for some minutes. It could be seen clearly with the naked eye less than a half a mile offshore. Mm. It could be seen more clearly with a good pair of field glasses which were in the house. Oh, great. The women called to Mr. Craig, who scoffed and remained in the rose garden. Classic Mr. Craig. He had almost to be dragged in to take a look. Then for 20 minutes, he watched through the field glasses while Ogopogo swam quickly around. Then there was a sudden swirl of water and Ogopogo disappeared, end quote. Hmm, okay. Okay, so um, I believe that they saw something. Sure. I believe that they saw something they think. Sure. Is Ogopogo. Yeah, sure. That's my statement mm -hmm. of facts, right. Mike. To put a fine point on it, the author of the article quotes Hamlet. Oh, oh. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Holy crap. Right? Jeez. I love that quote, actually. Wow. So how about them apples, you doubters? I, well, that's, I, I'm stymied. Exactly. I've gotten, I have no counter arguments. In 1955, the Vancouver province ran a two and a half page article on Ogopogo. Damn, that's a lot. It was titled, He's a Bit of an Earwig and a Bit Whale. Oh. Uh, calling back on that song. Song, yeah. yeah. that gave the sea serpent its name. Yeah. The water serpent its name. Ah, I see. You can do it too. Anyway. The article's author, Glenn McDougall, wrote, quote, one warm, lazy Saturday afternoon, A.M. Moore, a tourist camp operator at Peachland, was standing on his boat wharf gazing out over the blue waters of Okanagan Lake when he noticed a strange disturbance offshore. As his eyes peered across the water, they nearly popped. You don't want your eyes to yeah, pop. Yeah, I was just going to say exactly that. 500 yards from where he stood, a series of huge serpent-like humps, deep green in color, were mm. breaking the surface of the lake. The fantastic creature swished lazily about in the surf as if sunning itself, then began moving slowly northward. Mr. Moore could not distinguish its head, but there were at least four slippery smooth humps, oh. about two feet in diameter, stretching for nearly 80 feet. Oh. For several minutes, the thing remained in view, the waves lapping against its sides, allowing him time to have a good look at it. Then, when a seaplane roared overhead, it disappeared under the foam. I was scared. Well, of course, scared, scared off by the, the sea seaplane. Darn yeah. seaplane. Who did that song, My Humps? My Humps? My Lady Lumps? That's all I can think of now. Yeah. There were at least 14 other people present at this sighting, including Moore's wife, two daughters, and visitors at the camp. And I mean, how could uh, reporting uh, a late serpent help a tour operator? Oh, like no, unrelated. Yeah, it has no benefit. No to benefit no at be all. And unless there's girl guys seeing it, I don't believe this. Note, there's more outdated and culturally insensitive language in this next quote. Oh boy. The article reminds readers of the indigenous origins of the legend. When the Oblate Fathers came to the Okanagan Valley in 1860 to open a mission, they found the Indians were already well acquainted with the lake monster. According to the Indians, Ogopoga lived in a secret underground cave on an island located near Squally Point on the east side of the lake. The Indians told of finding stains of blood and great piles of bleached bones on the island, where they believe the monster devoured its victims. When the Indians crossed the lake near this point, the squaws were said to crouch in the bottom of canoes, hiding their heads under blankets to avoid seeing the terrifying serpent. Well, I'm stuck on the, uh, the, the secret underground cave. Yeah, right. That's what, like, I'm picturing, like, he, he has to, he's looking around, making sure nobody sees him. He's looking around, then he comes up, and then he has to, like, move some, some uh, bushes. Yeah. He has to move some underwater bushes. And, okay, and sure, underwater bushes. Underwater bushes, and then, like, open a fence, and then go in. Like, he's, yeah, it's very secret. 
Another sighting mentioned in the article is that of a local doctor who had seen Ogopogo out running a boat on the lake. I know vision over the water is deceptive, Dr. Underhill said, but I know I saw something. If that wasn't Ogopogo, it was certainly something unnatural. It was not a fish, and it moved too quickly for logs or debris, mm. end quote. And he's inserting his own skepticism there, but yet saying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, he's a doctor. Other sightings describe a, quote, lithe, sinewy monster, oh. 75 feet in length with a coiled black and dignified demeanor. <laughs> dignified? Does it have a monocle and a top hat? <laughs> That's Whoa. why I put that one in there. Whoa! Because I thought, dignified demeanor. What? Hello, I am an Ogre Pogo. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, pip, pip, cheerio. I'm Ogre Pogo, and I'm going to, I'm drinking my tea with it's one a, flipper up. Excuse me, would you happen to have a spot of tea? I've got my flipper pointed oh, out. Carry on. Cheerio. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> a youngster ran to his father telling him about finding what he believed to be large web-footed six-toed footprints on the beach. Oh, my God. So we can get out of the water? So that's all we need is like a lake demon creeping around <laughs> on land. It was like, oh, great. <laughs> wow. I guess one day it was just like, you know what? I'm going to check this land out. <laughs> I'm going to go. I'm just going to go up there. And what, what little kid would fake that kind of no, thing? No, no, no. Never no, happen. No, it would no, never happen. No. Let's see. I'm going to go. Let's see what's up there. Exactly. Ooh. I'm, I'm oh, I yeah, have sorry, a my dig bad. dignified my, demeanor. Yeah. I think I'm going my to bad. go. Well, you should venture forth and see what's on land. <laughs> I'm going to toodle along. <laughs> An Anglican minister told of his encounter with Ogopogo, a minister. Okay, okay. this is getting serious now. Okay, a okay. man of the cloth. Yeah, the dignified man of the cloth. Quote, the lake was calm and there was no wind when suddenly the water began to splash violently. Oh, no. A series of humps appeared, which Mr. Beams described as like a huge hose threshing about in the water, but he did not see the head at all. The disturbance continued for three or four minutes until the creature disappeared under the surface again, leaving a terrific wake behind him. Then the lake was perfectly calm oh again. Goodness. End quote. And this is over and over again. This is the same thing. Mm -hmm. People see the same thing. Mm -hmm. a, by the way, it was a terrific wake. A terrific. It was, I really thought that I saw that wake earlier. I thought, they, what a terrific They're not wake. using terrific in the same way that you're using no, terrific. No, no. What a, that's a man. That week? Did you check that? that was terrific. terrific. <laughs> there have been numerous other sightings involving multiple people describing much the same things as previously told. Starting in the 1970s, though, some of the articles written about Ogopogo began to take on a more skeptical nature. Finally. Yeah. In 1971, UBC scientists used sound recording and sonar devices to search for Ogopogo. That Guess was, what they found? Nothing. Exactly. That was huge in the 70s. Sonar? Yeah. That was... Let's use the sonar. Yeah, everything nautical, you got to have sonar now. In 1977, after one woman described seeing, quote, three shiny green humps while swimming with her daughter, a local skeptic and member of the Federation of BC Naturalists said that the sightings were most likely due to how the human brain perceives, quote, bow waves as they move across the surface of the lake, creating an optical illusion. I'm going to go with this naturalist, which, by the way, sounds like nudists. Like, would a naturalist no. be just like, no. um, I do science in the nude? I got my wiener out. <laughs> For science. For, get your wiener out yeah, for, science. for science. Well, that should be a t-shirt. Hey, look, I got my wiener <laughs> out for science. Oh, jeez. I don't think anybody would buy that. Oh. There are many people, though, who still think that something is there. In her book, In Search for Ogopogo, Arlene Gall writes extensively about the possibility that the demon of the lake may be a landlocked plesiosaur. Whoa. According to Encyclopedia Britannica... Plesiosaurs are, quote, any of a group of long-necked marine reptiles found as fossils from the late Triassic period to the late Cretaceous period, 215 million to 80 million years ago. Plesiosaurs had a wide distribution in European seas and around the Pacific Ocean, including Australia, North America, and Asia. Some forms known from North America and elsewhere persisted until near the end of the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago. Could you imagine being the last plesiosaur in Lake Oklahoma? You're just like, how long do you live, first off? But like, second yeah. of all, it's just, you're just like, 
Where did everybody go? <laughs> where, where did Man. all the other plesiosaurs go? I'm not that difficult to be friends with. Man, I'm bored. <laughs> Arlene Gall spoke to a Ravernon Courier reporter in 1977 in an Ogopogo expose. Oh, my goodness. Quote, maybe, she says, Ogopogo was produced from a fertilized egg which was deep frozen by the Pleistocene glaciers that later covered Lake Okanagan. End quote. Well, there was a whole bunch of words I don't understand in there, so I'm going to have to say, sure, sounds plausible. But it's global warming is what caused Ogopogo, okay. because the glaciers go away. Out of the curve. There's yeah. Ogopogo. Yeah. So what's next? I don't know. Godzilla stomping around Vancouver? <laughs> Clearly. Any yeah. Day now. Uh, this reminds me of a TV movie, though, that oh. I've worked on. Oh. I was the assistant location manager. Yeah. It was 2008. It was called Beyond Loch Ness. Oh, God. Or alternatively, Loch Ness Terror. And the film summary on IMDb is as follows. Oh, I can't wait. A rash of suspiciously gruesome murders in a sleepy lakeside town <laughs> has authorities stumped. They soon realize the culprit is not only connected to the lake, but in it. <gasps> they must figure out what it is and how to stop it before it's too late. So essentially an egg-laying creature swam its way through underground caverns. Loch Ness Monster mm -hmm. swam its way mm -hmm. through these underground caverns to make its home in the Golden Ears Park where it munches on local residents. I mean, Golden Ears is a beautiful, I could see why you'd want to go there even yeah. even as a Loch Ness. Yeah. You, it's, it's a beautiful place to go. Um, yeah, it sounds logical. This film was directed by Paul Ziller and stars Brian Krause. He d did a lot of TV like... Uh, he was in Another World a long time ago. Sure. Carrie Genzel, who's a mm -hmm. friend of mine, uh, she was on uh, All My Children. Oh, you have kids? No. Oh. Niall Matter, Sarinda Swan, oh, who's sure. CBC's Corner oh, now. Oh, wow. And two late great actors, Donnelly Rhodes of Danger Bay okay. and Don S. Davis oh. of Battlestar Galactica. Wow. Uh, so, as well as many others. Here's some audio of the trailer. Oh, God, yes. Released by Sony Pictures and made by Insight Film. Shot mostly in Maple Ridge. As it should be. At locations that mm -hmm. I was the assistant location oh, wow. manager. Can we hear the locations? No. No. Oh. But let's, uh, you and I will watch the video I... as uh, others hear. Dun, dun, dun. We think some sort of predator may have gotten into the lake. I saw it, and I know where it lives, and this time I'm going to prove it. I'm a cryptozoologist. Study animals? Unknown species. I'll have to see his remains to help you find out what killed him. Find what? A killer dinosaur? Your little lake that you love so dearly is about to become a feeding ground for a race of carnivorous prehistoric reptiles. <laughs> through the window oh my god scary right holy that's like the jaws of canada yeah pretty much wow yeah so i worked on that crap wow did you did you do the special effects no but phone? i was there for the yeah wow anyway wow. so we'll post a link to the trailer for beyond lock they're gonna they're, suddenly they're gonna like a spike in downloads well i do have a copy of it we oh can watch <laughs> Anyway, the sightings continue. In 2018, oh. a video emerged, and it was shot by a David Halbauer oh. in West Kelowna in September of 2018. Global News picked up the story. Was he a girl guide? No, he was not. I don't think he was a girl guide. Something tells me he wasn't. Well, we'll find out, hopefully, in the but story. Let's listen to the audio, and we, yes. you and I will watch the video as, as others listen. I'm going to close my eyes. When you're sitting on the beach on a sunny day, you don't expect to see a dinosaur come out of the water. David and Keith Halbauer are still buzzing after sighting something they say was about 15 meters long swimming in Okanagan Lake last week. I saw this black form come out of the water, cylindrical, and then roll. You guys seeing that? 
Yeah. That's the very beginning of the video. Awestruck, the men at first can't believe their eyes as they said they watched the snake-like creature undulate in and out of the water just off a beach in West Kelowna. There you see it there again? I can't tell. I can't tell what I'm seeing. I was blinded by the reflection. The video dips up and down because Halbauer says he wasn't sure what he was seeing, let alone filming on his cell phone. I would say diameter-wise, uh, as you put it, I, I don't think I could put my arms around it. Like a dinosaur, I guess. It was like a giant, giant snake. Keith believes he's now witness to the legendary and elusive Okanagan Lake Monster. And we're both looking at it, and I said, that, I think I see Okapogo or something. His brother, still stunned. I don't know what it was, but then I saw waves behind it, and I, the rest of the lake was calm, so it was pretty neat. But just as quick as it appears, what they're watching, Ogopogo or a rogue wave, just as quickly disappears. That's when the waves rolled in about, I don't know, 10 seconds after. But their experience is proof of one thing, Ogopogo may be elusive, but its legend is very much still alive for those who want to believe. Doris Maria Bregalisi, Global News. Now. Okay. Now. Yep. Yeah. This is not a sign. I'm not judging character here, Mike. Okay. But these fellows look like they may have had a few wobbly pops. They might have. They may have had their, you know, chilling at the beach. And did you notice the Pink Floyd music playing in the I, background? I did. That's I, why we can't watch the entire raw, uh, raw video because they were probably having a little fun yeah. and uh, listened to some Pink Floyd and they yeah. saw that. Yeah. So that's that's wobbly pop music. Well, maybe more than wobbly. Yeah. Pops. And we're, so, we're not entirely sure. You know, they they there was some video there. Yeah. There was some video there that um, I did not see a cylindrical right. serpent-like thing, but, um, you know. Yeah. Maybe with a few wobbly pops, I would. <laughs> maybe. But, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. It, it was covered. By the but news. in 2018, there were three reported sightings. Oh, that was a big so year for Ogopogo. From OgopogoQuest.com, a site with tons of information on and historic photos and videos more videos, quote unquote, oh. <laughs> of the Kelowna cryptid. Quote, after three reported Ogopogo sightings in a span of less than three weeks, Kelowna's global news anchor followed up with Bill Stessia. Oh, okay. So here's the audio. Yes. And yes. Scott and I will watch the video. Yes. Again, we'll post all the links to the videos yeah. for everybody it's to important. see. It's important. It's important for you all. When did you become a believer? 1978. How come? I was coming across the bridge. I lived on the west side. You, it, you'll love this story. It's absolutely incredible. I'm coming down the hill, right? Okay, and I get halfway through the bridge and I look over. That's before they had the railings. That was the old bridge. And there's three humps in the water and a head moving towards Kelowna. So I put my flashers on, got out, get on the railing, and I'm looking at this thing. Now, before that, I was not a believer. And to top it off, what happened was I backed up all the traffic coming down the hill from the west side, and they all stopped and got out and looked at it. Absolutely incredible. And I always wanted to do a scientific, you know, uh, expedition to, you know, because nobody had ever done that. And the first one was 2000, when I had some time, and, you know, that was, well, it wasn't that much farther. It was 12 years later. So we did a survey, by the way, in 99 of 1,000 residents of Kelowna, if you saw something in the water, would you report it? 8% would. 8. 8%. <laughs> so if you look at all the sightings, credible sightings over the years, okay, um, and if that only represents 8%, do the math on that. It's beyond belief. So people are seeing something in the lake, and they're not reporting it. But in today's day, where everybody's got one of these in their phones, they're glued to it, why haven't we got some crystal clear video? Well, uh, that, that, that's, <laughs> that's a really good question. But, you know, like those two, like those two fellows of Bear Creek, I think they, they, they were pretty excited, you know, and they were trying to get a picture into the sun and it was bouncing up and down. And I've, I, I, we've had sightings where, where people have a camera hanging around their neck and they don't get a picture. It's just the spur of the moment, and, and most of the time you don't have a lot of time to get it. 
you know, these creatures don't stay on top of the water forever. So it's that, it's the excitement. And then even if they get the camera up, they ain't got to focus it, or not anymore, but, so it's a whole bunch of things, spur of the moment stuff. So a few things. A few things. A few things, Mike. What do you, what do you have uh, for, for Bill? Thank God he put his blinkers on the bridge. Right? He put his hazard safety. lights on safety, safety first, first when I... you're looking at the, <clears throat> the, the, at the lake creature. Right there. That says a lot about his character. Yeah. Second of all. Yep. No, I'm not going to do your work for you. You do the goddamn math. Yeah, he asked us to do he, math. He said do the math. That means you don't know the math because you're I asking his, me to do the I math. I think the math that he was doing was Karen from the internet kind of math. <laughs> what did I, okay, so if only 8% of the thousand people. Go report it. Imagine all the ones that go unreported. Do the math. How, no, I, there's, you, you, we're missing some equations here. Right. Oh, and he said nothing. As soon as I saw that guy, right out of the very first frame, I thought to myself, this man knows science. Ogle Pogo has actually become quite famous. Good. So much so that it even made an appearance on the cartoon Mike Tyson Mysteries in episode oh 10 God. of season two. <laughs> my favorite show. The summary for the show reads, quote, it, the team takes the pigeon mm -hmm. to his old lakeside home to see his hot ex-wife, Sandra, who turned him into a bird mm -hmm. and signed their divorce papers. Mm -hmm. A kooky old Native American warns the team of something called Ogopogo that lives mm. in the lake, end quote. Have you watched this? No. Oh, you, oh my God. I've I watched, have. I've watched some of the, the show, but I, not, I, 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 I don't watched remember this. I, no, I've watched this episode, yeah. Oh boy, I need to watch it. Oh my God. It's so, amazing. but if creepy, rapey, bitey, punch drunk Mike Tyson talks about Ogopogo, it's gotta be real. You don't need anything else. Please don't hit me. Canada Post even issued an Ogopogo stamp in the 1990s. Look at that thing. That looks like I'm, for the people who aren't looking at it like I am right now, it looks very much like a dragon. Sea serpenty. A sea like ser ocean a, a serpent. Horse water. dragon. Yeah. Uh, eel. Uh, Seahorse. Um, a corn. Like that. That. He's got, he's, got a, like, he's got a tail. That guy makes me think unicorn. So what could... Ogopogo B. Could it be otters mm. swimming in a group, kicking up the water? Yep, that's a very distinct possibility. Is it a huge sturgeon or school of fish? Maybe. Is it an angry scuba diving Canada goose or beaver? Oh, probably. Yeah, they they got their, they're known for that. Yeah. Rogue waves, we've already mm -hmm. talked about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or is it really a landlocked dinosaur? Or is it just that everyone who claims to have seen Ogopogo are suffering from sunstroke or have had too many wobbly pops. Yep. Um, those are all much more viable options. Right. <laughs> than a sea creature living in a lake. Yeah. In 1989, mm -hmm. the late Jim Walker and other Ogopogo protectionists <laughs> celebrated the passing of a wildlife regulation banning the capture or killing of any as yet unproven species in BC. Sure. Great. Includes Bigfoot, everything. Yeah. A Kelowna Courier article highlighting Walker's life after he passed away from cancer told of his accomplishments. Quote, Walker explained the regulation to the Vancouver Sun on September 1st, 1989. Quote, Under the Wildlife Act, we can prohibit any person from capturing, killing, or even harassing the creature. Now we can protect the creature because we can put a total closure on its capture, Walker said at the time. It would be most exciting if it was some species not known before. Well, I mean, good for you, Jim, for yeah. for passing, getting this law. Because just in general, like, I don't think the, anybody's first reaction to a new species should be kill it. Well, it is for some. Yeah, I know. But it's my opinion, and I don't think it should. So good, pass that law saying if it's a new, new species, don't kill it. Although how you would know if it's new or not. Other stories over the years have suggested it's just one more case of casual cultural appropriation by European colonizers twisting the indigenous legend to fit the capitalistic desire to draw more tourists to the region. The original legend has more to do with respect for nature than some of the bizarre Loch Ness monster-esque things. There seems to be something to that. Most articles show up in summertime mm -hmm. or just at the height of the tourist season. Hmm. That sounds so unlike uh, European colonizers. Right. In May of 2000, a Reuters article reported, 
Penticton, British Columbia. Wanted. Scientific evidence of one elusive mythical lake creature. Will pay $2 million. 1.3 million American. No capture necessary. After years of unconfirmed sightings, Ogopogo, Western Canada's equivalent of the Loch Ness Monster, has now a reward on its head thanks to local businessmen mm. who have taken out an insurance policy just in case it is found. Wow. wow. There have been so many sightings you have to believe there's something out, said John Singleton, manager of Penticton's Chamber of Commerce, which hopes the $2 million reward will also boost tourism. Oh, for a minute I thought you were talking about the director of Boys to Men. Not that John Singleton. Uh, R.A.P. We'll end with a poem oh, from gosh. BC pioneer Susan Allison, as published in Arlene Gall's In Search of Ogopogo, Sacred Creature of the Okanagan Waters, for Hancock House Publishers. Oh, oh great. Miles to westward lies on an island, an island all men dread, a rocky barren island where a monster makes his bed. So busy are the fishers that they hardly spare a glance to the black line of white-crested waves that so rapidly advance. From the westward, from the island, the island all men dread, from the rocky barren island where the monster makes his bed. And that's it for this week's case. This is a serious poem, Mike. Right? This is a serious poem. So thoughts on Ogopogo fun? So let me fun? tell let me tell everybody a little little story about Scott. Okay. Uh, when I was... I'll just have a nap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to need it. Carry uh, when on. I was, uh, say, 11 or so, roughly, maybe 12, maybe 10, you know, plus or minus a year, um, one of my neighbors, mm -hmm. his uh, father was a, a musician, and... Uh, he was commissioned to do the theme song for what was to be a cartoon. Oh, wow. Of Ogopogo. I believe it was called Ogie. Ogie, okay. Yeah. And um, I got to sing in that <laughs> theme song. It was just me and, and- How old were you? Oh, 11 or so. Oh, that's and, cool. But it was just like we just were supposed to be a bunch of kids chanting like, Ogie. Okay, I, if I remember correctly, we had to do so many takes. It was like we we really couldn't even nail just Ogi, Ogi. Really? Yeah, and we had to like okay, now let's try it again, maybe a bit more, and do it right. You know, yeah. <laughs> thank you. But yeah, so I almost my my wonderful dulcet tones mm -hmm. were almost almost part of a TV series. Almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't get made. Didn't From get what I understand, I mean, if, if it got made, it's some news to me. Oh, there you go. But I don't think it did. I think that uh, it, it uh, despite, Dis my, despite, despite your my, amazing voice, yeah, despite my uh, commitment and dedication to the show, and my, I bet you had they known, I would have been a podcaster later in yeah, life. Yeah, maybe. Would have been like, shit. Yeah, maybe. We need to make this happen. <laughs> okay well let's uh so yeah there's some, that's, that's my story mike uh let's listen to some voicemails oh, i'm just i get anxious you know why because i'm just waiting for the one that's like you guys are fucking idiots i'm gonna come and punch you okay so uh here's one uh this one's a short one okay let's have a listen Hi, Mike and Scott. Uh, greetings from the nation's capital. I had a couple of case recommendations if you guys are ever running low. Um, first, the massacre of the Black Donnelly family of Biddulph County, Ontario. It was in the 1886, something like that. The other one is the weird stuff that was happening with Quebec Bridge in the early 20th century. I think there was a collapse in 1907 and another one in like 1916, something like that. It'd be really cool to hear your guys' take on it either way. Um, and do you guys have family day in BC? I don't know. Uh, happy family day tomorrow, if you do, and uh, go shit in your hat. Well, thank you. They have bridges in Quebec. They apparently do. Wow. They have some bridges in Quebec. Wow. Well, speaking of wobbly pops. <laughs> Wow. She came in guns a blazing. Guns a blazing. Guns a giggling. Yeah, that was fun though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know anything about this um Quebec Bridge. 
Yeah, thing. we'll have to look into it. Yeah. We're very familiar with the Black Donnellys. Yeah. We are going to do a, a podcast on that eventually. Yeah. But that's one of those ones that gets told a lot. Yeah. So I, as I scour other podcasts, some people will tell that story and I tend to leave it alone yeah. until yeah. enough time has passed. But We're waiting for the Green Donnellys. Right? That's when we jump. So here's another one. This one's a short one. Only 27 okay. seconds. This could be the bad oh, one. Gosh. Oh, Jesus. Hi, guys. My name is Sarah. I'm a listener from Chicago, Illinois, and I wanted to tell you guys that I love your podcast, and I think that it's informative and funny. And driving the other day when you had the gunshot in there, I about jumped out of my seat. Um, so I just wanted to tell you guys you're doing a great job, and I love the dark history episodes that you guys throw in there. So... Keep up the good work and go take a shit in your hat. There you go. Well, oh. well, thank you. I think Chicago. Chicago. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you don't want to hear bears. gunshots in no. Chicago. No. No. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. That's uh, Everybody's coming in giggling. Yeah, well, what is happening? Have you ever listened to the voicemail, Scott? You, should, you yeah. probably should. Okay. Uh, all right. Huh. Here's another one. Uh, this one, uh, let's go back a little bit okay. further. All right. And this one is from a little while ago. Uh, we just haven't gotten around to playing it yet. Oh, okay. Hi, guys. I'm just re-listening to episode 109. I really appreciate y'all's uh, light that you put on the uh, dis dis services and maltreatment of mistreatment of um, natives. I love that part of the show. Um, I was just thinking the word squeamish. You ask people if they're squeamish which made me look it up, and I was thinking maybe somebody could be completely squeam or squeam-ish. <laughs> anyway, I'm in New Hampshire. Well, actually, I'm in Vermont. New, uh, and I would love to see you guys at, in one of those get-togethers, crime get-togethers, crime comp. But it's... Okay, peace out. Okay, he turned into a robot. At he the turned end. into Did a you... little bit of a robot, but that's that was, okay. That was uh, wow! Thank you. That um, was great. Yeah, I I really <laughs> sometimes <laughs> sque- could you be full squeam? He could be. I mean, full that's squeam. a that is. I mean, it's a great observation. I think is what I would call it. It's a great observation. <laughs> that was a very pleasant yeah. uh, voicemail. A little yeah. different than our usual fare, but I yeah. I quite enjoyed that. So did I. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, full, yeah. Could you be full squeam? You should, could be full squeam. Sure. I could be full squeam. Yeah. So if you want to leave us a vo- voicemail, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or 1-877-DARKPTN. That's 1-877-DARKPTN. Uh, if, you, if your call stands out, you might hear it on the show. Even if it doesn't stand out, you still might. You still might hear it on the <laughs> it show. It stands in. If it, yeah. Uh, it's time for our shout outs for our Patreon patrons mm-hmm. and uh, some our donut money donors. Mm. So this week's good eggs. Let's let's go with some good eggs. Which, by the way, I didn't have a donut today, but I did have a Tim Hortons muffin. You had a Tim Hortons muffin? Strawberry cheesecake muffin. Carol bought us some Tim Hortons tea. Oh. So we can steep our own steep tea. Whoa. Wow. It's quite good. Is it, eh? Well, you like the steep That's tea. That's all I drink there. Yeah, but uh, I, oh, I, I was really so mad do. I the other day. I went through, it's in the drive through on the way to work. I got to get my steep tea double double, please. Uh, sorry, we don't have any tea right now. Steep teas right now. And I was like, oh, for the love of God. Okay, give, give me a. And I just like, cause I'm not a fan of their coffee. So I had to be like, just dilute it. Give me like a triple, triple. There you go. Yeah. So uh, we got some uh, new patrons. Uh, up first is Jennifer Proven. I don't know where Jennifer's from. Jennifer Proven? Yeah. Any relation to Jeremy Piven? No. Oh. Okay. Jennifer uh, Proven. Yep. And she is from? The North Pacific Ocean. Okay. And uh, whereabouts in the North? Is there any specific? She's just floating around there? She has a boat. Okay. Yeah, she has a boat. Like a trimaran? Have you tried my Moran, by no, the way? No, I have Have you? Not. Oh, you really should. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a, it's a two Moran. <laughs> it's a catamaran, Scott. Yeah, that, well, that's what people who don't ride, ride them call them. Oh. Yeah. A two Moran. We call them, us two Moran riders call it a two Moran. So, yeah, she's a two Morani. And 
Is that what she does for a living? Well, yeah, she's documenting and traversing the, the North Pacific the Ocean. The North Pacific Ocean. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Somebody had to do it. Somebody had to do yeah. it. Next up, we have a Samantha Alice. Yeah, Samantha. Yeah. Did you say Atlas? A- no, <laughs> uh, Alice. Oh, Alice? Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, she, oh, yeah, she's from uh, Claude, Claudad de Mexico. Okay, and yeah. she's from Mexico. Claudad de Mexico. Okay, what does she do there? Um. Oh, boy, I don't want to. Uh, she, what she does there is she's a, so, you know when you go by, like, fast food restaurants or you go by uh, gas stations? Yeah. The, not not the, all signs. The are, flappy arm thing. No, no, Mike. No. Oh. Not all signs are digitized yet. Some and are so, people. Well, no. Some you have somebody has to to change the lettering. Oh, she's a letter changer. Yeah, which huh. I mean, most people assume that it's the employees of the no, store. There's actually a contract. It's contract. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a yeah. contract. It's and big she's, money. She's got seven hundred contracts. Oh, jeez. Just think about how many signs. Mexico need. is a very densely populated place. Yeah, in, in yeah. Mexico and, well, no, because that's just in three blocks. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and so uh, yeah, they're so, all El Pollo Locos. Sure, I don't know what you that know, is, but a, it sounds good. A, the crazy chicken. It's an LA restaurant. Oh, it sounds so, great. Oh, it's fantastic. But uh, yeah, so she that she 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 does that. She has to go and change all these signs, and um, it's tedious. It's tedious. Yeah, I'm sure it, it, it is. It's, it's it's a grind. Yeah, and um, she's she's looking. She's trying to branch out and look for new opportunities. So well, so best, yeah. Best of luck. If you hear if you get a resume across your desk from Samantha Alice from Mexico, then hire yeah, her. I can I I hundred percent uh refer recommend her. There you go. Yep. Um, next up we have from Chandler. Arizona, not Chandler Bing, but uh, Chandler, Arizona. He should have his own city. He should. Kate Kuhn. Oh. Yeah, Kate? so thank you, Kate. It's my mom's name, Kate. How do you feel about that? Great. You're not Kate. Fantastic. You can't answer for her. Maggie Lawrence is our next patron. Maggie Lawrence. That name does sound very It very really familiar. does. I don't know where Maggie's from. Not uh, uh, not Joey Lawrence. Uh, okay. Not to be confused with Joey Lawrence. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, she's from, uh, uh, Calamella. where is that? Uh, it looks like Chile. you're looking, in oh, it's in Chile. Yeah, Calamella in Chile. Oh, what, yeah. what does she do in Calamella, Chile? Guess what she does. I don't, I don't want to guess because I'll be wrong. She grows chilies. Well, fantastic. Yep, yep. the spiciest, hottest chilies. Mm-hmm. She was talking to me recently about that, um, and, oh, and she really want. Oh, what's happening? I don't know where that's coming from. Wow. Okay, stop. Okay, go. Yeah. So she she was. We were talking earlier, and she and she she's actually wanting to send me some chilies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she wants us to eat them on the show. Oh. Yeah, because she was listening to the after show. That the we one just that did. the people yeah. haven't heard yet. Yeah. Because. Yeah. But people will but hear if it. You were, if, we're if gonna, you were, we're going to release could, it. You could hear it. We are going to release it. If you're a five dollar patron or yeah. above, you can hear it now. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like that's what that's what I was getting at. Is like if you want to hear it now, mm-hmm. just you know, five dollar patron, you yeah. can go hear it right yeah. now. Where we eat wacky things, or I eat, we eat wacky thing. Um, but yeah, so she she grows chilies there. Oh, and guess how? What, guess what the size of the biggest chili she's ever grown is? Three feet. That's a really good guess. Yeah. That's exactly it. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Next up, we have Sarah Whitson, and mm-hmm. she is from Calgary, Alberta. Oh, well, there we Thank go. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Next, we have Jenna Blaze. Oh, wow. I don't know where Jenna's from. It looks like you're looking in uh, Asia. I don't know. You're somewhere in yeah, Asia. Kind of, kind of, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, this is, okay, what? Oh wow, Russia! Your fine, your fine print is in Cyrillic. Are you having trouble? Get uh, Dina Levina to help you out with that. Oh my God! Wow. So it's in Russia somewhere. Uh, Kursk. Kursk. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Kursk. Yeah. Was also the name of the uh, submarine, submarine that, that sank. went bye bye. 
That's not good. That was a tragic story. So uh, hopefully Jenna Blaze does not make screen doors for submarines. Whoa. I don't, I don't think that would, that doesn't sound like a great idea to have. No. <laughs> no, nope. it's not. Yeah. What does she do in uh, Kursk? Well, uh, she doesn't like to talk about it, but I'm going to out her. Okay. She builds submarines. She builds submarines. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, given the reputation, uh, she, the, she has no liability. She was no part of the sinking, like none right. of her work. Yeah was responsible for this. She does great submarining. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So next up we have somebody that we, I, I actually do know where she lives. Oh. I don't know what she does, but, oh, uh, okay. it's Geralee Spence, one okay. of our younger yarders. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I know she lives in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. Oh, what a beautiful. I know for a fact that mm -hmm. she lives there. Yeah. But what does she do in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia? What do people do in Spring Hill, Scott? Oh, there's, you've got two options really. Okay. Lobster fishing. Nope. And <laughs> and working at the local brewery. Well, that might be one. Yeah, she does neither. She does neither. No, she doesn't does neither. she work in the mine where most of the people work there in, also, in Spring Hill? Also neither. Oh, okay. What, that, does, what does she do there? She builds. Mm-hmm. You ready for this? I'm with bated breath waiting. Mm -hmm. yep. She builds chairs. She builds chairs. Yep. So Jerry Spence... Chair builder. Yeah, that's what it says on her card. Do you, do you have one? No. Oh, she yeah. hasn't given me one. Yeah, she builds chairs. Well, she's very, very artistic, though, and a very modern, but yet very, like, there's, they, make, they make statements. It's very creative. They make statements. Mm -hmm. she, like, she's like the Banksy of chairs. Oh, my God, that's a great, yeah. And they'll be, like, upside down. Mm -hmm. Or backwards. And then people. It's like you have to have knees that bend the wrong way. Wow, right? And people will come over to, to like uh, the store where they're sold and they'll see like these upside down chairs. And every time, every time they come over and they're like, they think they're tipped. Oh, like I'll pick it up and they're like, no, no. That's the right way. That's the right. Just like, sit down, mister. Yeah. Yeah. They're not comfortable. Well, thank you, Geraldine. Yeah. Lastly, but not leastly not for least. our Patreons, we have Alexis Boothby Young from Chilliwack. British oh. Columbia. Gone, oh. gone, gone. She's been gone so long. She's been gone, gone, gone so exactly. long. Exactly. My girl. I, I love that song. Oh, I yeah. used to love Chilliwack. Yeah. With uh, uh, Too Loud. Uh, Too Loud McLeod was the guitar player. Oh, wow. He's passed away from cancer, but. Well, oh, that's, that's really quite the downer. Yeah, but. Uh, but Oh, so thank you, Alexis. Boothby yeah. Young. Yeah, my friend used to, we used to watch, anytime we watched Cloverdale, he called it Chilliwack. I don't know why. <laughs> we used to go, we used to go to Chilliwack Airport for pie. Didn't you and I yeah, do yeah. that one time? Uh, I don't know if we went, but I've been there. Yeah, it's gone though. Yeah. The pie atorium is gone. That's sad. Oh, but, but it, well, like, I didn't know until people told me, like, it really had, like, the best pie in it. It really did. Yeah. I love the pie yeah. there. It was fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, people have sent us some PayPal oh, cashola. Hold on, but on the pie, like you, they would actually give you like the glass, like if you wanted to take it home, they would give you like the glass container that it comes in and you, cause they just trust that you'd bring it back. Oh. Yeah, it's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. So first up from, uh, our Patreon, we have Jennifer Proven oh. again. Wow. Wow. Thank How you, about Jennifer. that? Yeah. So, um. Uh, yeah, I guess she threw us a PayPal donation as well. How about that? That's very nice. Very nice. And Thank next, you. Next we have Irene Brienne. Oh. Uh, she says, hello. Nope, I'm not a private person. I am a full-time mom to a young adult son and a teenage daughter who have autism and who love the craft yard, craft oh. barn, and the barnyard, especially Bulldog Steve. <laughs> Love you guys and keep up the great work. I finally got to meet Bulldog Steve in person, and he's fantastic. And Matthew and, and Steve have become our l l like they, they are be our mascots. Well, they become like uh, dark poutine celebrities <laughs> more so than us. Well, I'm good with that. Yeah, it's it's really crazy how it's like people are like, oh hey hey Scott, I'm like oh where's Steve? <laughs> like, it's exactly. really no, something. Like I love it. You I need someone to, to distract from us. Yeah, I love it. Uh, thanks so much for uh, to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges, and thank you for providing us a little donut money. We really pr appreciate your support of the show. If you want to help support us, you can do so at patreoncom slash poutine or. You can send us donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. 
If you don't already, it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the show. You can easily find us on iTunes, Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. You can rate us on podchaser.com. Check out our website, uh, darkpoutine.com. For show notes and other cool stuff, give us a like or follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. The best thing. Until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> that was uncomfortable. A little baby grass. A little bit of go pogo. Just not how the song went. Oh, well.